Hundo, nothing personal word of the day for Wednesday, September 28th, 2022 is 100. Hundo, however you want to say it. Century, that is the number of millions of dollars that Kyrie Irving of the Brooklyn Nets is claiming that he gave up by not being vaccinated. For whatever reason, he is of the belief that the Brooklyn Nets, I was about to say New Jersey again, amazing right off the top, four, six, nine, hundo. <laughs> We're not going to redo it. The Brooklyn Nets are a mess. Ben Simmons may play this year. He likely will. James Harden lost a hundo pounds. Double, double meaning of the word of the day. How do you lose 100 pounds in the offseason, Coca? Can't do it. There is no diet where you lose 100 pounds because it's not like over the course of a year. I guess if you had, there's a, there's a GI surgery you can have that maybe that can work. But 100 pounds, maybe he was kidding. So Harden's gone. Simmons is there. Durant doesn't want to play with Nash and Marks. The owner says, come on, play. They meet. KD says, all right, I'll play. Shows up to training camp. We talked about media day yesterday. We talked a little about the teams and what was going on. But then all of a sudden, the story comes out about Brooklyn. Every year, there's something with this team. But what struck me about the Kyrie Irving situation is his total level of delusion. He's the one who, at the end of last season, which, again, is only a few months ago, who remembered that the Warriors beat the Celtics? That was like in June, July, August, September. Three months ago, that's it. Very bizarre. So he's the one who was allowed to explore a trade. He picked up his one remaining player option. He's getting paid scores of millions of dollars. He was allowed to explore a trade, and of course he's at training camp in Brooklyn because who wants Kyrie Irving? He is not worth that price. But it has nothing to do with vaccinations. It has to do with whether or not his off-the-court persona, antics, viewpoints are worth having him on the court. Where is he in his prime? Because when you're evaluating a player and the pain in the ass that they are, you evaluate it according to their ability, to their ability to help you win games, to help you win championships. And Kyrie Irving is on the back side of that, not on the front side. But if you become more difficult but less good, that means people are not lining up to sign you. So, of course, Kyrie Irving could not find the team. But then he started talking to the media about the fact that by not being vaccinated, he gave up four years over $100 million because that was offered, and then it was taken away. And when I read it, I read the story in Counterparts. So I read Kyrie Irving's quote first, talking about the fact that he gave up the four years and – I was wondering whether or not Sean Marks, the GM, would respond to that and whether or not that was true. Because in my situation, if I had a long-term offer to a player and, that, and then a situation changes, I'm likely going to honor that offer. And it actually happened in my career when we had an offer to Martin Prado on an extension. Jose Fernandez passes away. We are not going to be as good. We're going to try, but 2017 is not going to be as good. Maybe we'll sign a pitcher like Volquez to try to win some games. But there'd be no reason to extend Prado because he's going to be on the team when the team is rebuilding and not good. But we made an offer, and the offer was accepted, not in writing. So it's not like the Dominican situation that we talked about with those young baseball players. But... Morally, which is funny to say because running a team, it's not as though morals always are number one on the list. But we signed Prado the way we said we would, and I never get a thank you. I always thought that when players get paid more than they're worth for that particular contract, that it would be nice to get some sort of Christmas card, just something, like some acknowledgement like, wow, I never heard back from Salta La Macchia. John Buck and I are in touch because we're friends, but... He doesn't often just call and say, hey, man, thanks a lot. I'm on vacation right now, and that's because you guys gave me an extra year. You don't hear for that from players. So Kyrie Irving does not get the deal that was discussed, apparently. And he then claims that the reason was not being vaccinated and that he was threatened that if you don't get vaccinated, then you're not going to get this contract that we agreed to. 
And that was strange because that is not something that a GM I would think would do. So then the second part of the story comes out and Sean Marks, who has had nothing but problems as GM of the Nets, he's had to preside over this absolute dumpster fire of an organization. How he keeps his job is interesting. I think this is a huge year for him. If Durant and Simmons and Irving cannot somehow be at least to the conference finals, I think that will be the end of Marks. I think they'll have no choice. If you're the owner of Joe Sy, you've got to do something. But Marks had to respond to it. But we've told our GMs so often when we coordinate responses and work on the PR, not everything requires a response. You can respond internally. You can talk to your player. You can talk to your team. But a public response requires a different level of necessity as you are evaluating whether or not you're going to say something and then of course what you're going to say but sean marks came out and said hey there was no ultimatum here we didn't say do this or you won't get that but sean marks then doubled down on the statements he made that we broke down on a show whenever it was last month or two months ago when sean marks was talking about players and how they need to be accountable how they need to be reliable and he was talking about kyrie irving as you remember last year he couldn't play home games for a long time so only he was playing on the road and that's after he came back from not playing at all because the nets just decided not to play him when he couldn't play home games correctly so so sean marks comes out and actually says hey not only was there no ultimatum but it's not, we can't force anyone to take the vaccine. That's a personal choice. But then he said there was a pre, so there was a statewide mandate for vaccinations, which there was. And once those mandates came in, we knew that Irving couldn't play, which is true. So contract talks stalled. So he wanted to make sure to differentiate for all of us, both in the media and fans, that there was no done deal. And that comes from legal advice that the Nets got over this situation. Because if Kyrie Irving wants to claim that there was a contract that was agreed to, and then it was pulled because of something that would make it illegal to pull it, such as a personal choice of religion, which Kyrie Irving could claim I didn't get vaccinated because of religion. He could claim I didn't get vaccinated because of microchips. He could claim all sorts of reasons. But if there is a deal in place and then all of a sudden the circumstances change where a deal is no longer in place and the circumstances that changed the view of one party or another are not simply a change in financial circumstance or a change in ability or a change in injury status, let's say, but a change in vaccination status or a statewide law, there could be an opportunity for Kyrie Irving to claim breach of contract. Frankly, he could actually allege that New York was tortiously interfering in his ability to do a contract. That's my favorite cause of action. Tortious interference in a contract. That's when you have a contract with someone else and somebody gets in the way of you fulfilling what you what your obligations are in the contract and then you get sued by the other part of the contract for not doing what you're supposed to do in the contract and you say hey i would have done it but for this person who tortiously interfered in my ability to do it so maybe he could argue that new york state tortiously interfered or new york city or the mayor it was de blasio and then adams so sean marks is dealing with this saying, hey, there was no contract in place, it just stalled. A stalled contract, totally legal, you can change your mind whenever you want, no problem. So you've got that in one corner of Media Day, and then in the other corner of Media Day, you've got Steve Nash, the embattled coach of the Brooklyn Nets, having to answer to what it's like to be back with the guy, your superstar, top four player in the league, maybe top three, maybe top two, maybe top one. I have to do a list of top five players in the NBA. Coco, where are you in the top five players in the NBA? Where would Kevin Durant be? Maybe we should make a list of that. But he'd be certainly on the podium. But you've got Steve Nash having to answer questions for what Durant did by saying, hey, it's either me or him. And it turned out to be obviously neither because Durant wanted to get paid. So Steve Nash had to say, listen, we're good. It was a family squabble. We always like to say that. 
say, hey, it's like family. That's what I would always say when there was problems in the clubhouse. We'd say you're together more than you're together with your family. You're together with your teammates. It's just a family thing because we think that adds relatability to fans or the media where they can say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's why there are two people killing each other in the clubhouse, towel whipping each other naked because it's families and that's what families do. Clubhouses are not families. I'm sorry. There's so many things that we want you to believe about a clubhouse that, hey, there's love between players. There's love between players and managers and players and coaches. There certainly are players who like other players. There are cliques, though. And there are, there are teammates who go an entire season and they don't say a word. It's actually the equivalent of your workplace pre-COVID where you actually had to go to work and go to an office where there are some people in your office who you never talk to except for when you need to talk to them in order to do your job to get your salary, to get your bonus. So there are players who will only talk to each other, literally not say another word. They'll get on a six hour flight across the country. They sit in different parts of the plane. They don't play in the, the card game with each other, different card games, and they don't talk. It's not a family. Maybe that is family. Maybe that is family where people don't talk. So Steve Nash had to say, hey, his main thesis when we would be, and, and, and the Brooklyn Nets PR people would be, how do we deal with this issue? Because it's almost like with the Phoenix Suns and, and, and what happened with Sarver, with the Celtics, what happened with Udoka and, and with the Nets and what happened with Durant. There's a certain list where you know the players are going to be asked as much as you want to protect them, as much as you don't want it to happen. So Steve Nash and the Nets knew that Kevin Durant conversation was going to come up. And so the best they gave, the best arrow they could put in Steve Nash's quiver was, hey, I never thought it was 100%. It's not black and white like that. There were a lot of factors. What do you expect him to say? Yeah, man, he thinks I'm a terrible coach, and I, I don't blame him. We stunk last year, but we're good now. No, you say, hey, you, the media got it wrong. That's the most popular way to diffuse a situation is just say, hey, journalists, 2022, they didn't get it right. Makes me smile. NBA season starting, baby. There's going to be some stories. Aren't there always? There's a code in sports. I think it's a reasonable code. There's lists of things that you should do and that you shouldn't do. There's team rules. There's game rules. There are interpersonal relationships professional and personal. There's dress codes. There's all sorts of things. There's one rule that goes above all of them. And you would think that's the gambling rule, which is the number one, do not bet on your own team. And above that, do not bet against your own team. Okay. I'd say that's, that's a good one. That's probably number one. What would you say is the number two rule in all of sports. And it is the number two rule. Wait a minute. Let me, let me, let me amend that. Got no prompter here. This is just me and you every day that ends with Y except for Saturday and Sunday. I think it's the number one rule in business and it may be the number two rule in sports. And the rule is this. When you work for Coca-Cola, you do not give the formula for Coca-Cola to people at Pepsi. When you work at Goldman Sachs, you do not give your client list to Morgan Stanley. I'd say that's the number one rule. More than not wearing apparel of your competitor or drinking or eating food from your competitor. Like if you work at Nabisco, you're not eating Hydrox, right? I think we're all clear on that. That was a chin microphone touch if you're watching Nothing Personal with David Sampson on YouTube. That's a big one, right? Oreos, Hydrox competitor. So in sports, number two behind gambling is do not give your opponent your game plan. It's very secretive, especially in football. Those people guard it like they've got the codes. 
the game plan gets put into place and you share it with your players. Remember the player, Coca, who lost his playbook and left it like at a fast food restaurant or left it at a store somewhere and someone found a playbook? It was either a professional team or a college team. Je ne me souviens. I cannot, remem I cannot remember for the life of me when it was. There is an allegation out there that Herm Edwards, the guy, the coach, remember the former NFL coach, he now coaches at Arizona State, there is a rumor out there that his own staff members were leaking information to Arizona State opponents about their game plan in order to get Herm Edwards fired. I want to say it again so you've got this. The level of mutiny, the level of treason is second only to Russia-U.S. spy stuff like Snowden type stuff. Can you picture an assistant coach knocking on the door when there's a home game at Arizona State, knocking on the hotel door of their opponent and saying, hi, my name is John Cocktoast and I've got a present for you. This is our game plan for tomorrow. Good luck. Oh my God. I have a tummy ache from this story. Every single one of those staffers, if they are ever found out, they should be fired on the spot and never work again in sports, ever. I don't care about what you think about your coach. I don't care about recruiting violations. I don't care what your record is in Pac-12 games. I don't care about whether you win bowl games. I don't care if you wanted a promotion and didn't get it because you wanted to be an offensive coordinator and you're just a assistant offensive coordinator. I can't think of what the job is below offensive coordinator. Offensive line coach and you wanted to be an offensive coordinator. I don't care what corporate ladder you are trying to climb. You do not violate that rule. Yet the story is about Herm Edwards. There isn't a coach out there, Bear Bryant included. I don't know why that name's in my head. Is he the most famous college coach? Maybe. Who's the most famous NFL coach? Vince Lombardi. Maybe he's not the most famous. Bill Belichick, Nick Saban, he's way more famous. Nick Saban, Alabama would be an unranked team. Hot take alert because I'm probably speaking in hyperbole. Alabama would not win a national championship if Nick Saban's assistants gave their opponents every game what the Alabama game plan was and what order they were running their plays, etc. Tom Brady is not good enough to overcome a defense who knew everything that the offense was running. Even with Tom Brady in his, I'm still with Giselle Prime. You can't overcome that. I've been a part of a lot of mutinies. I've been a part of a coach who tried to get a manager fired. I've been a part of executives who have tried to get GMs fired. There are different ways to do it. The most common way is that you go over the head of the person you're trying to get fired to point out the inadequacies of that person from your perspective. The fact that your team could be better, you could be winning more games, you could be more successful on the field, off the field, etc. That's sort of standard practice whistleblowing. Not that it's illegal conduct, but the whistleblowing in terms of, hey, I want more responsibility, or I don't even want more responsibility, but I want our organization to be better, don't you? Therefore, we should have a change at the top. If Herm Edwards' assistant coaches or staffers thought that they'd be better off without Herm Edwards... Why not just go over his head to the athletic director and say, listen, here's what's going on during practice. Here's what's going on during recruiting. We are better. As Coco would like to say, let's be better. But to give your opponent leaked information about on-field operations, my level of anger is at the tipping point, but I'm trying here on this random Wednesday morning not to blow your volume socks off, but I'm trying to put it in your head 
that if you are trying to advance in your career, if you're trying to accomplish something and you think the best way to accomplish it is by bringing down the person you're trying to climb over, all you're doing is lowering both of your levels because, and this is not to comment on whistleblower statutes and all of the things that come with whistleblowing in the world of fraud, in the world of death, where you are contaminating water and soil or doing things that are hurting by contaminating food, whatever you're doing, where there's a public health interest or a money interest. But when you are doing something on the playing field and that's your modus operandi, it's not punishable by prison because it's sports. Let's not go crazy on field stuff. I mean, it's not like Rui Tomjanovich type of Kermit Washington. Hey, that was an assault or in hockey. What was the name of the hockey player? I'm testing my memory as I approach double nickels. Could it have been Blackshear? What did, we're going to go off the rails here, Coca, and let's just do a quick search, get in my ear while I move on to the next topic. But was there a hockey player named Donald Blackshear? And is he the one who was charged with an on-ice assault? Definitely could be mixing stories, but I feel like I may not be. So the last thing on, on Hermie Edwards and his future, he's got way less to worry about than those staffers. Now, they may stay anonymous, like whistleblowers are supposed to, but guess what, in sports, it's like a sewing circle. Everybody knows who did what to who, when and where and how, and how lascivious, prurient, and salacious the actions were. Did those staffers really think that they were gonna have careers after doing it? They're D-O-N-E, done. Phil Mickelson's done. Spoiler alert, not with Liv. Phil Mickelson, not, not Dino Cicerelli, Coca. Dino Cicerelli was a, a very, very well-known from a long time ago sort of crazy hockey player. When you search Blackshear, do you get, was he not a hockey player? Was there not a hockey player named somebody, Donald Blackshear? Oh, Brashear. And he did nothing wrong, no suspensions, no, like when you Google him, nothing comes out, like a lead story. All right, I'm moving on to Phil Mickelson also being done. Oh, he was charged. He was charged with assault. So I got it. Wait, was it a deadly weapon, meaning the hockey stick? I think it was. Although you're only telling me deadly weapon, so you're not telling me what the weapon was, but I think it was his hockey stick. That was a big thing. So Phil Mickelson is done. Thank you, Coco, for finding that. I don't know. Someone asked me this the other day, detour. Someone said to me, why is it that you have an inability to remember good things and meaningful things that have happened in the course of your life, but you can come up with ridiculous sports facts from your time in baseball or from your time as a sports fan. And so I asked my therapist about that. And I said, why do I block out so many things? And I only remember bad things from childhood or from adulthood and good things sort of get lost to the extent that there are good things, which of course everyone does and I've had more than most. But yet I can pull the name Brashier sort of out of my tuchus. It's very strange. He has no answer. Marty McSorley is another one, by the way. He's another one. He was a bad dude. I believe that he was, um, he was teammates with Gretzky. So Brashier was the... So Brashear did not get charged. It was McSorley charged for hitting Brashear. You got it now, if that's what you're telling me. <laughs> All right, let's go on to Phil Mickelson, because he's done. We ruined the transition. I don't know if you want to recut that. So if you do, let me give you a clean in. Here we go, ready? Two, 40, 69. I'll tell you who else is done. Phil Mickelson, spoiler alert, He's not done with Liv. He's done with the lawsuit. Remember the lawsuit that Liv filed against PGA and the tour for, it's really a antitrust lawsuit, basically saying that the PGA tour is making it so no one can compete with them. And Phil Mickelson and a bunch of other players who defected, which is really an unfortunate word because I associate defection with like country. He defected to Russia or Cubans who defect to the United States. I don't know if it's really defecting. Like when people, when Herschel Walker, 
I don't know if he went USFL to NFL or NFL to USFL. Right now, I can only focus on his failed, what I hope will be his failed centipede. Have you seen any video of Herschel Walker and his centipede? And I'm not getting political because you can be on whatever side of the aisle you want, and I will give you respect for the most part if you have actually cogent reasons why you believe what you believe. I don't want to put my beliefs on you. But Herschel Walker? Herschel, if you vote for Herschel Walker in the state of Georgia, God help you. And the reason God will need to help you is because that means that your decision-making process on all sorts of other decisions you're making may not be exactly sound and give you the results that you want in your life. So Herschel Walker, people say defected. I don't like using that in sports. But that's what we say in golf. All these players are defecting to live, which is ironic using defect in Saudi Arabia in the same sentence. So the Live Tour, they're the ones trying to get the TV deal, and they've got all this great interest. And remember, they've got 18 networks bidding to show Live. Well, by the way, none of them are bidding to buy rights to Live Golf because it's dirty money that is supporting this tour, and it's not like they're hiding it very well. Go back to past episodes and just search sports cleanse, money cleanse, and you can hear some segments on that. But it turns out that they're going to have to do what I had to do with radio in Montreal. You had to buy the time from the radio station and sell your own advertising. Boo. We want rights fees. We want guarantees. We want to get paid even if we stink and can't sell one advertisement. But when you can't get paid a rights fee, what you do is you go to a network and say, hi. My name is David, and I've got 162 games at three hours each, plus a pregame show of 15 minutes, a postgame show of five minutes. So basically, I'm going to give you three hours of programming, and we're going to buy that time. So you don't have to program it. You don't have to buy, pay for talent. You don't have to pay for syndication. And in return, we'll write the check to you. We'll sell the ads, and we'll try to make money that way. And the radio station says, good luck with that. We haven't been able to sell squat for your team. Certainly not the amount that we're charging you. But we got to be on radio for baseball. All right, sorry. I just had a Will Ferrell old school moment when I got back into what happened to me in Montreal and also in Florida, by the way. And now it's very common in all of radio because radio and baseball is not the financial boon that it was 20, 25 years ago. So Fox said, all right, we'll sell you the time. And Liv is going to have to sell the advertising. Do you think there'll be a lot of Saudi Arabia commercials? Like maybe Qatar Airways, Emirates, maybe some commercials from their Chamber of Commerce, which is not called the Chamber of Commerce. It's more like the Chamber of Death and Sawbones. But people at Fox, believe it or not, are not that happy because when you let somebody on your airwaves, most people do not differentiate between did you pay them a rights fee or did you just sell them the time? The fact is you are associating your brand with that company or that individual who's on your network. So Liv maybe showed on Fox, it may not. But Phil Mickelson yesterday said that he is no longer involved in the lawsuit against the PGA Tour. He wanted his name removed, and a bunch of the players did, actually. There were about four of them who said, we're suing you, PGA, back when it was really very contentious, and they left PGA. They joined Liv. They got a ton of criticism. It was a maelstrom, which is the worst ride in Disney. Has anyone been on Maelstrom at Disney? Is there anything more boring than that ride? I don't even know if it still exists because my kids are older now. But the maelstrom of negativity that came the way of the golfers that they had to weather the storm. They've sort of weathered it. They're playing the golf tournaments. They're winning money. They're winning tons of money. The PGA Tour has made those changes that we've discussed where there's bigger purses, more tournaments, more opportunities for people at the bottom of the tour to make enough money to survive above the poverty line and get from tournament to tournament. But don't misunderstand the story here. Liv is still suing the PGA. And the outcome of the suit in this case has nothing to do with the plaintiffs being individual players versus the entity that is live. When Phil Mickelson, 
join the lawsuit to sue PGA, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that part of his contract, whether it was spoken or not, was that he had to join that lawsuit because it would give credibility from a PR standpoint to what PGA Tour was allegedly doing to live and their anti-competitive measures. But from a legal standpoint, them being on the lawsuit or not is wholly irrelevant to the cause of action and to whether or not Liv will prevail. Now, why are they continuing with this federal antitrust lawsuit? And the answer is because when you have an opportunity to show legally that your competitor is not playing fair, the general view in the business world is that that's going to help your business. But the thing about Liv, it's not a real business. It's just a toy by Saudi Arabia. It's like a write-off. Of course, Saudi Arabia called Jared Kushner, best-selling author, and said, hey, do you, guys, do you mind, Jared? You wouldn't mind calling a bunch of networks and seeing if you can get them to put us on the air and pay us a rights fee, right, and legitimize us. Would you make that call? Jared had about as much success there as he did brokering peace in the Middle East. So the lawsuit's going to continue. Phil Mickelson's off it. But then he had to give quotes about why he was off it. And what interested me is that he had to say that I am focused on moving forward and extremely happy being a part of Live, while also grateful for my time on the PGA Tour. <laughs> do you think his agent had anything to do with that? Although he's got such a huge guarantee, but the fact that he's sort of a pariah when it comes to sponsors. Do you think that maybe he's doing a little reclamation project? Where he talks about that he's good where he is because they bred his butter. They, four, eight, nine. Because they butter his bread. But hey, I sort of want to still be able to get free cars, free watches, free clothes, free shoes, free everything. Because I still love to gamble. So I got to say that I'm grateful for my time on the tour. And then other players came out and said, I'm extremely happy to be part of Liv. Does that sound familiar? Now that I'm no longer a member of the PGA and with Liv's involvement in these important issues, I've decided to forego my involvement in this matter because I have faith that Liv will successfully make the legal case. That was the golfer Poulter. And what made me laugh is that statement was written by Liv, maybe with some input by his agent, but it really doesn't make much sense. All right, Coca, I will. How long, wait, how long has it been? Did we go long? All right, let's go to break then. All right, we're going to break. Oh, we only have 12 minutes left. All right, we're going to break. When we come back, we're going to review murders in the building, and I'm going to tell you a story about what's going on in baseball because it's pretty good. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name is David Sampson. Thank you very much, Matthew Coca and I. Matthew Coca and I are here for your listening and viewing pleasure. Thank you for spreading the word. It's working and we like it. Coca could not necessarily get into this, but I think you can. It's called Murders in the Building. We reviewed season one. They got a bunch of Emmy love. Didn't win, but nominated. All that counts is being nominated. Horse hockey. Not one celebrity who gets nominated for an Oscar and Emmy says, oh, isn't it great to be nominated? No, they want to win. Hey, it's really great to make the playoffs. We're so proud to make, win our division or win the wild card. We get to say that we broke our playoff streak. We get to sell tickets that we broke our playoff streak. No, they want to ring. You're in it for the win. When you are in a competitive industry, which is sports, which is Hollywood, which is every industry, you satisfied? With trying, is that enough? No. There's winning and there's misery. Right, Pat Riley? Murders in the Building Season 2 came out, and it may get some Emmy nominations as well. Did you know that Selena Gomez has more followers on Instagram than Justin Bieber, Demi Lovato, or Miley Cyrus? Selena Gomez is in Murders in the Building with two of my favorite actors, Steve Martin and Martin Short, who acted together in Father the Bride, among other places. Steve Martin, brilliant musician, brilliant actor, brilliant comedian, brilliant author, one of the all-time all-timers. And it's a show about a building in New York City 
where a murder happens and it's about a podcast and the whole arc, it's 10 episode show and each show is a podcast, but it shows how they make the podcast. And it's got Tina Fey in it, who is a very popular podcaster in this show. Give it a moment in terms of its quirkiness. Give it a moment in terms of its silliness. Give it a moment in terms of its goofiness and you will get paid off with a really good story, with a lot of plot twists, with great writing created by Steve Martin, great writing where the payoff with the finale always, always has a surprise. There is a guest star who's only in the last scene of the finale and it's so good that you'll have a little tear in your eye and a smile on your face. It's called Murders in the Building. Okay. Excuse me one second, Coca. Thank you, I'm back. I have a frog in my throat. I'm about to have a terrible day. Is it too personal to talk about my day? It's not personal. When you're over 50, you have to get a colonoscopy. I'm getting one tomorrow, which means I can't leave the house today, which means that I'm going to get to watch some serious content as long as I can have an iPad or something that I can bring into the toilet. If you are over 50 and you're listening to this, which is about 34% of you, I would encourage you to make sure that you get a colonoscopy because you can totally prevent colon cancer. And I'm doing the endoscopy, so I'm getting a double, north, south, two poles, one time, one sleep. Because Barrett syndrome and all the times that you watch me on, on YouTube and I have to mute it and I have to greps or I have to do something, they check your esophagus and make sure you're okay. So that's my day. What are you doing today? 111 and 84 is our nothing personal pick of the day record. I don't understand how the Cardinals, congratulations, they won the Central. They did it. The Brewers were favored. The Brewers keep trying to not make the playoffs, like to spite their general manager. When you make a trade like the Brewers did when you trade away Hater, and you hear on nothing personal that that was a great trade for the Brewers, but the players were livid, and all of a sudden the team's playing like crap. But now they have a chance to make the playoffs. Where's the pride? Philly is begging you to overtake them. Begging you. The Padres are sort of pleading with you, but not begging. And yet you can't take advantage. So we lost. We won 11 and 84. Here's our pick for today. Do you remember the name Tyler Glasnow? the number one pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays, the guy who we got to wait to see right, who was going to be a free agent after this year, but signed that two-year deal with Tampa, even though he had Tommy John, because he didn't want to go into free agency where he would have made $100 million more than Luis Castillo got paid by the Mariners. He would have made way more than that, but not now. He had Tommy John. He's back tonight. The Tampa Bay Rays get him back, and they're playing the Guardians, who are the surprise team and the greatest story of the season so far, the Guardians having won the AL Central. But I've got the Rays, who are still fighting with the Blue Jays. There's not a lot of excitement left in the playoff race. What a bummer for baseball. And by the way, happy birthday, Commissioner. Rob Manfred's birthday is today, which is pretty good. I don't know why we celebrate birthdays. Like, it's a year getting older. Sort of depressing, isn't it? There are people who like celebrate the whole month. They're so excited. I do not like my birthday. I don't want to be reminded that sand is falling out of my hourglass of life. Like, I don't need that reminder. I'm going to have a thing when we're doing a show on February 26th. I don't even know what day of the year that is. Um, I know what date it is. I don't know the day. I don't know if we'll have a show that day. But I've always looked at double nickels as sort of, all right, now you can really say you're heading into the back nine. I mean, a lot can happen in the back nine. A whole round can be made in the back nine. But criminy. Happy birthday, Rob. So the Guardians are a good story, but the expanded playoffs have been a total dud. MLB had to send a tweet to everyone reminding them how exciting the National League wildcard race is because the Brewers are fighting it out with the Phillies and the Padres, blah, blah, blah. The Braves and the Mets tied. Everyone's 
crazed about that, but they're both making the playoffs. But you do want to win the division, so you don't have to play the Dodgers until the LCS, and you can get a bye. That's sort of exciting. The American League, yeah, what's exciting about the American League? Nothing. I guess who's going to host? Toronto, Tampa, or Seattle? I guess that's sort of exciting. Maybe. Not really. So the Guardians clinched the Rays over the Guardians. That's the pick of the day. But what can you expect if you're a Tampa fan? And I do want to mention, please try to stay safe. When you don't live in Florida, I always was struck by this. Hurricanes, when you're in Florida, it's a major thing, right? It, you have to prepare your house. You have to put up, um, oh, come on, Coco. What are they called? Um, shutters. You have to put up shutters. I still have a scar. Can you see it on the camera right here? A scar from me, and I'm not exactly handy. I can't even change a light bulb. And I'm on ladders with Larry Beinfest and Mike Hill, like the brain trust of a major league team, and there's a hurricane coming, and we're on ladders trying to put these metal spikes over your windows, hoping that flying objects don't get in your house, break a window, and all of a sudden your roof comes off, and then you can't collect any insurance, which, by the way, you can't get in Florida anymore because who would want to insure the absolute sea level climate change rise and hurricanes that go on? But it's a thing. But the rest of the country's like, oh, that sort of sucks. It's like reading about Rwanda. Man, I wish that wouldn't happen, but past the green beans. But hurricanes, they suck. And there's a big one coming toward Tampa. And behind the scenes, what's going on is a major conversation with Major League Baseball, all the sports where there are sports events happening. You can't just cancel events at this point in the season. You have to reschedule them. You have to play them. You have to think about, are you going to play them at a neutral site? Are you going to go to the road team's home stadium? Does that work? Are you going to try to get games in before the hurricane comes? But then what happens if the teams get stuck? As a road team, you never fly into a hurricane and get stuck. That's a simple, hard no. So you're dealing with the commissioner's office. All this is going on. Happy birthday, Mr. President. So what do you expect from Tyler Glasnow? When you come back from Tommy John's surgery, you have to understand that while Tyler has had rehab starts, while pitchers who have missed a year, they have worked their way back with a mound progression, they've faced hitters, they've pitched in games. When you are pitching at the major league level, it's a different sort of situation completely and fully. There is an opportunity for Glasnow to come back and be a productive pitcher in a playoff run and in October for Tampa. But it is unlikely that he will be an ace. And the reason used to be that because you're not going to get length. But the way Tampa is, their definition of an ace is, hey, if you can go twice through the lineup, five innings, no runs, hand it over to the bullpen, we have a chance to go to the World Series assuming that the bullpen doesn't blow it when you pull Blake Snell. But assuming all of that, we have a chance to win the World Series. So Tampa is the perfect team to have a pitcher coming back from Tommy John and maximizing his ability to contribute. So not only do I have Tyler as the pick of the day today, but I also have him as the number one performing starter in the postseason because of the way we are looking at number one starters. He's not going to get a complete game. When you have pitchers back from Tommy John, there's a progression. Remember, that's the whole story I told you about how much it crushes me that Jose died the day he did because he was only out that night because he wasn't pitching the next day, which he was supposed to pitch the next day. But Scott Boras was so angry with his post-Tommy John pitch count that we agreed, which still crushes me, we agreed to delay his start by a day. So, Glasnow will be on a pitch count a pitch progression. And the theory there is that it is the way to keep him and that pitcher ready for the next season. So when a pitcher recovers from Tommy John, not a hitter, when a pitcher recovers from Tommy John, no matter when they come back during the course of a season, and this is very late for a pitcher to come back, so it may bleed a little into next season, but the season after that's when they're fully back. So I would look for Glasnow to be good, but not what he was. But that's why they got him back for next year at that huge price. So I close by once again mentioning the hurricane. I'll give you a little, a few things. There's a bunch of games going on in Tampa. 
you've got a Sunday night game going on with the, the Chiefs and the Devil Rays and the, um, oh my God, <laughs> with the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, there's a chance that they'll move that game to Minnesota. Who knows? But the fact is, Tampa already announced they're leaving Tampa and they're spending the week practicing in Miami, which had a bunch of hurricanes and a bunch of tornadoes in Broward. It's just bad. Everyone be safe. Be smart. Don't go out. Your cell phone video, I don't care if you get a million views. It's not worth it. The juice is not worth the squeeze. Stay inside. Be safe. Hunker down. Listen to past episodes. Watch some good content. And remember... Not only will we be back tomorrow, but with me, it's just business. This is nothing personal. Man, that was a bad ending, Coca. Damn it. All right, ready? 4, 6, 42. Everyone stay safe. Be smart. The juice is not worth the squeeze. Don't go outside. Don't get the cell phone coverage. We'll see you tomorrow. It's just business. This is David Sampson.